One, two, three. I think we're almost ready to go. Stop I think we're just about ready to go. G'day folks, welcome to Comp 1720, week three, 2022, semester two, streaming live from Canberra, as always. Folks, I'm doing the second take of this week's uh, lecture because yesterday I had a problem with my throat and I couldn't speak very well. I Hopefully, I will get through it today. Um, you can hear I'm still a bit croaky, but hopefully in a bit of a better place to, to do a lecture without having issues. So we're going to keep it calm, slow and quiet. It should be the ASMR version of the 1720 lecture. I'm just going to announce it on the team in case anyone wants to join me, but I, I realize that it's a different time for the lecture, so um, maybe folks are not available this morning who might normally be. Uh, going to run for the lecture now. In if you're available. Just check that everything's going. I think I'm recording. That's my main thing, to get a good recording. Get it up on YouTube, get it up on Echo360. We do want to have a, a nice video for folks who are joining in later, and I don't want to have them hearing me cough for many minutes. So let's get straight into the lecture. I'm going to go really go from the beginning, just to, just to recap a few things. We won't go in great detail on the first few slides, but 
the main thing this week, folks, is to start your assignment. Your assignment is due on Monday, actually. I'm just going to make sure my volume here is maximum. Oops. Zero dB, that's where I want. And turning that one up a little bit. A little smidge. <laughs> Grab your butter menthols, let's code. That's exactly what we should do. I should have got some butter menthols. There are some in the kitchen. I might grab them later. Assignment one's due on Monday. Remember the Git process that you've learned over the first two weeks, if you're new to that. Um, make sure you are looking at the whole of the assignment, not just the code part, but we also want to see a really nice statement of originality with two references. I want to see a really nice artist statement, and I want to see that, that image PNG. The reason I like the images is because we can make a gallery with all the images afterwards. So it's really fun to have an image available. And I'll probably ask folks to make their monster image, maybe use it as your avatar on Discourse or something, just as a fun way to, to celebrate the art that you're making in this course. Your course reps are now available. There are two course reps listed on the website. I'll just go to the website. If you want any help on anything in this course, if there's something going wrong, you need help with it, you don't know what to do. I've got a help page. This is your one-stop shop for all kinds of help. Um, I've got specific situations where it explains to you what to do. And we've got general advice and we've got our course reps who are Melody and Shreya. Thank you so much to Melody and Shreya for volunteering to be course reps. Um, there were a number of people who volunteered to be course reps and I was so happy that people are really engaged with this course and want to take that role, but I think we only really need two. Um, to manage the, the kind of absolute requirements. But I think everyone should know that there are wonderful people in this course who want to help you. So if you ask something on the forum, there are people who are going to jump in with an answer. A few other things where you can find help. If you need help with any aspect of computing, please talk to the Computer Science Students Association. Go here, there's the link. These folks are just excellent. They are incredibly happy to help you. I'm a lecturer and they even help me sometimes with stuff, okay? Many of my tutors are people who are organizing the, the CSSA and they help me all the time figuring things out in, uh, in the world of computing. It's great to have different perspectives and I really rely on the perspective of you young folks out there in the CSSA to, to do interesting, cool stuff. This is a great page to go to. One of the reasons I have this page is to help people to solve problems without having to set, leave in emails in my inbox. Um, if you send me an email, I will probably reply to you eventually, but sometimes I get a lot of emails and sometimes it's the weekend and sometimes it's the middle of the night, but there are ways for you to get help yourself. I guess I could have a chat bot or something that would just send you these links and maybe that would be more successful, but um, this is the low tech way of doing it. A list of situations and a list of links and a list of people you can talk to. So that's the help. Example assignment one. Now, folks, I know people love to see an example for their assignments, so I, I made one. This was my assignment one. Oh, I don't want to log in. Come on. Oh, there we go. Not too hard. This is freely available to you. My assignment one submission. I've got all the parts of the assignment completed to some standard, a basic standard. There's my monster image. There's my blue robot. I showed you this. If folks were here yesterday, they will have found this. I, you may not know this, but whenever you push up your assignment, it goes onto a website and you can actually see what that website is. There's a way to work out what the URL is, but if you also just go to the, oh, sorry, I'll show you what I click. I click the tick. That's the thing that makes it go onto the website. I click page deploy. And then down on this page, there's a link to my where my assignment is. And this is proof that my assignment has been submitted if it's up here, absolute proof. Sometimes if you're submitting at the last minute, the CI jobs take a while to run. So you just have to kind of trust that your files are all there. But I hope as you're doing your assignment and revising it, you're checking this link to make sure it looks the way you want it. Uh, someone asked me yesterday, what mark would you give this assignment? Um, realistically, this is probably something in the credit range because even though it's, um, it's tight, it's nice, it's neat, it's clean, 
it leaves some details on the table that could be improved. And I really did this as an example of, of a basic standard, not as an example of a high standard assignment. I, I'm, I know some folks in this course will spend many hours doing their assignments. This is something I just spent a few minutes putting together. Um, and of course, I know the course content very well, so I can spend a few minutes doing something and it ends up at the good standard. I don't want to say that everyone else is at that level. Um, there certainly be ways to improve this, make it more detailed, have more personality, have a nicer artistic backing for it. You could even have a background. I know that's not required, but it would probably, in this case, some kind of extra detail in the background would make it a little bit more uh, interesting as an art artwork. Uh, not required to pass, though, to do a, a background. So I'd love to say, yes, I can easily make a, uh, a, an artwork which is an HD standard, but, you know, I only spent a few minutes on it, so I wanted to make something that was uh, a decent standard. And all of my artist statements, my artist statement is there, my SOO is there. Whoops, where's my SOO? My statement of originality with my references. You can see this in the code version. There's my three references. You know, the, the basic requirement is two references. Three references is good. Um, I'm sure that many folks will have many references that they can put in. And I've got a basic artist statement here. It's a good number of words. It's makes sense. It explains what the artwork is, but it's not amazing. Uh, not going to blow anyone's mind, really. All right. <clears throat> so it gives you the, the example assignment here. It gives you an idea of what our basic expectations are. And it's up to you to take this and, you know, reach for the sky and make something incredible out of it. Okay. More detail about artist statements. You need to explain what your artwork is, why it's an artwork. This is in the, the spec for the assignment. Make sure you read that spec very carefully. Statement of originality and references. We've talked about that before. If you are asking me on the forum if something should be in your references, the answer is almost always yes. <laughs> okay, let's get into the content. Last week, we learned about the flow of work in P5. We've got our setup, draw, 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 draw loop. That's the flow that you get by default. And we talked about variables. You can declare a variable, let um, variable. You can define a variable equals 25. You can declare a variable and define it in the same line. You can make a variable that's a string. And you can make a variable which is a number or a number of a different type. But there's still a number. You can make a variable which is coming from another from a function in P5 or frame count. You can define a variable using another variable. Lots of things you can do with variables. Your way of storing information and bringing it forward through your program. I'll just see if there's any questions. No, no, no extra questions. Oh, yeah. I forgot to press go on the stream. Oh, man. I knew there would be something this morning. I'm off my, off my game. It was all connected up, but I didn't press start event. Anyway, it's okay, I'll upload the, the recording later, but for those who are uh, joining me now, you'll be able to see me in a minute. I'll just type the answer to that person. Uh, stream. I don't know about Microsoft Stream. It's a weird product. I think that that's... Um, may not be using it next year. <laughs> like it's going to disappear or something. It's a very strange uh, piece of software. Okay. And the flow we talked about. This is really one of the most important basic fundamental things to learn when you're learning about programming is knowing what path the computer takes through your code, the flow through your code. 
it's predictable, but you have to have some understanding of how the computer calculates code, reads it, makes decisions. So it is predictable, but you have to have a good mental model of how computer programming works. It's very, very it's probably more crucial in this course than some other courses because you're dealing with two mental models, the computer's mental model and your mental model of how you want your artwork to look. And as we know, your artwork is layers of shapes and colors on top of each other. So if you get the order wrong, your artwork doesn't look the way you want it. That means that if your mental model for the computer reading your code and the mental model for your artwork are out of whack, your artwork's not going to work. And I see this all the time in, in assignments in P5, not in things at the level that we're doing in these lectures, because we tend to do things that are uh, simple, but as soon as folks, you know, start to get their engines going, understand these shapes and colors and stuff and make really complicated artworks, particularly if they want things to change significantly over time, using lots of different variables, lots of different functions, suddenly the, the, the mental models can start to get a bit out of whack and then things start to look weird. So um, yeah, we have to be very careful with flow and always be thinking, what is the path that the computer takes through my code? The code is your instructions to the computer and the computer has to take its own path through it. I wonder if my stream is going to work now. Oh, I can't leave the page. Stay on page. Audience view. Oh, there it is. Okay. Welcome, people on MS Streams. Make sure my Teams is front and center here so I can see. Ah, uh, yeah. We talked a little bit about types of variables. Type is something, if you've done Comp 1100, you're probably obsessed about uh, uh, the types of variables because it's a very important concept in that language. Not very important in, in JavaScript. JavaScript is one of these languages where uh, you just sort of, it's designed to work intuitively and let programmers write code without worrying too much about stuff. This can cause problems later, but, um, and it does, but this is the way that it's designed. This is a design decision of the language. So mostly we've dealt with numbers like 42, number variables like height or mouse y or frame count, but there are lots of other types we could use. And the two code concepts for today that are new are these structured programming ideas. And the two structures in programming we'll discuss today are conditionals, that's your if then else structures, and iteration, where you're looping over code multiple times. Conditionals are all about making decisions. Should I go left? Should I go right? If I've done something one way, I'll go left. If I've done something the other way, I'll run this function. And this is the, the basic way in which you create code that will shape your artwork in response to inputs or changes in the, the code environment in your computer. So as frame count is, is moving, you change the way your code works. Here's a few conditional statements. If I run, I can make it to the tram stop on time. If I have a spare month, I'll read War and Peace. If I start, if I finish watching Netflix, I'll start assignment one, so a backwards one. When I start, I'll start assignment one when I finish watching Netflix. And the way that we encode this idea of a conditional expression or, or the way that we make a decision for a condition is by creating expressions that evaluate to a true or false value. And the true or false value has a special data type called Boolean. Uh, it's, a, it's related to this idea of mathematics created by George Bull, the idea of having two main values, true and false, and building up a kind of uh, logic or of expressions from those two values. So many folks will have studied a little bit of Boolean algebra, either in high school or in your undergraduate studies, or in the computer science classes you're taking now. Here, we're just gonna use a very uh, intuitionistic approach, I would say, about true or false. But here's some Boolean values in JavaScript. The sky is blue equals true, and the sky is red equals false. 
I always forget in using different programming languages. Some programming languages will like you to have true with a capital T and false with a capital T, but, but um, JavaScript is one of the ones where it's lowercase t and lowercase f. So that one's working. Whoops. <coughs> Uh-oh. I lost my lecture. Back to my notes. <clears throat> Here we are. Here's my Boolean variables. So when we use, have multiple variables, when we want to make decisions on some kind of variable, we can use these operators. They're like mathematical operators but their output is not a number, like one plus one equals two. That's a mathematical operator with two numbers as input, and the output is another number. These are operators where they have two different inputs that are a number, but the output is a Boolean value. So less than, if I take, uh, let's get a green pen for today. If I do one less than three, We've got two numbers there, and the output of that statement, evaluating it, is true. If I have five less than or equal to one, well, the output of that is false. Okay, similarly, we've got greater than, greater than or equal to and this one, equal to, really important to remember, two equal signs. So three equals equals three, evaluates to true. We have to remember in computing the difference between a test for equality and the assignment operator. So three equals three, In often in computing that means we're trying to set a variable called three to be three. So I could have let, you know, um, num equal three. We've got the same symbol there, equality symbol, but we're using this as an assignment operator. So it's a, it's a, a word in computing mean we're setting a value of a variable to something. And in JavaScript, one single equal sign by itself is the assignment operator. It's not testing whether two things are equal. So even I, I've been doing computing for a long time, even I sometimes accidentally don't type in both equal signs on something and my program might break or just work very strangely. Breaking is better, right? When something breaks completely, you know you've got to fix it, but when it just behaves strangely, it's hard to fix the bug and go back and you think, oh, wait a minute, why did I write one equal sign? What have I been learning in the last 20 years? Okay, not equal to is another important one. So in, in computing often the exclamation mark means you can read that as not. These other ones we tended to tend to cover in high school maths, right? Less than or equal to, of course they have a different symbol in maths for less than or equal to, it's got a, an extra little line there greater than or equal to. And then in computing, we don't have that symbol very easily. So we just do combine the less than symbol or the, the left angle bracket and an equal sign. So there's our, our comparison operators or our, our tests, which give us a Boolean value as output. And we can use them with the assignment operator to assign some Boolean variables, let x is small, mouse x less than 100. So if mouse x is 50, this will be true. But if mouse x is 500, this will be false. And you can see what our idea is with naming this variable, let x is small. That variable is going to be true if x happens to be small, smaller than our, our decided transition point from small to big, 100. 
And if x is 100 or more, it is not small by definition, by our definition. Similarly, let y is big. Mouse y greater than or equal to 500. If it, is, if it so happens that mouse y or the y value of the mouse is more than 500 down from the top of the screen or the top of your sketch, y is big will be true. Another one, let Jan is happy equal exclamation mark true. How do we read that? We read that as not true. Remember the exclamation mark means not in computing. So poor old Jan is just not happy. See, so this is a, a deep reference <laughs> to, you, you Zoomers out there probably won't get it, but there used to be an ad on TV in Australia where someone would be unhappy with their subordinate. Their subordinate was called Jan, and Jan was like always doing something wrong. And they'd say, not happy Jan. Was it not happy Jan? Anyway, so uh, Jan wasn't the one who wasn't happy. It was Jan's boss who wasn't happy. Jan would be out in the car park leaving and the boss would stick her head out the window. Not happy, Jan. Anyway, we should change it so that Jan is always happy. True. And let Jan's boss equal not true. Or maybe Jan's boss is always only is always happy if Jan isn't happy. And if Jan is happy, Jan's boss is not happy. Let Jan is uh, let Jan's boss equal or Jan's boss happy equal not Jan is happy. So we can flip around a Boolean value like that. Uh, folks, if you're studying Comp 1110, for instance, this stuff will not be a, 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 a mystery to you. You will have looked at this already in other computing subjects. But there are people in the class, I know, who have not done computing before in, in great detail. And some of this stuff will be new. We can also combine Boolean expressions. This last one isn't actually combining. We talked about not. These ones are. And so if x is big and we use two ampersands to define it and y is small. So we combine taking two values and we can use a logical operator between them that's going to combine their values. So we'll just read the sentence. If if x is big and y is small, then this whole expression will be true. So if this one's true and that one's true, the whole expression is true. If either one of them is false, if that one's false, or if this one is false, the whole expression is false. And if they're both false, the whole expression is false. We've got another one over here, the OR operator. If x is big or x, y is small, I'll just try to erase some things so it's a bit clearer, or y is small. Now, the whole expression will be true if there is a true value in either side of the operator. So if this one's true or this one's true, the whole expression is true. The only time that the whole expression is true when you've got an or is if everything in the expression is false. False or false means false. Um, many of you who study computing will know that there are a few other logical operators, exclusive or, but uh, we're not going to deal with that today. <laughs> and the not is an operator as well, it just takes one value. Not x is big, not, and we use the exclamation mark for that symbol, not x is big is the opposite. So if that one's true, the outcome is false. And if that one's false, the outcome is true.
So now we can combine our Boolean expressions. The sky is blue and the sea is red. The sky is blue or the sea is red. Not the sky is blue. And each whole line here evaluates to either true or false, depending on whether the parts of those lines are true or false. <clears throat> now, here's where we get interesting. Just creating these Boolean values isn't very useful. Why they're useful is we can use them to make decisions about the flow in our program. Here's how we do it. JavaScript has an if statement. So, whoops. If, in brackets, some condition, which will be a statement that evaluates to a Boolean value, in curly brackets, do something, else, in curly brackets, do something else. Ah, oh, yeah, the triple operator. Someone's asked a good question. We'll talk about that later. It's a JavaScript thing, having three equal signs. It's one of those JavaScript things that I always forget exists, and then I start teaching Convolute 1720 again, and someone asks a question about it. I'm like, now what does that do again? And I have to ask the, the students to help me answer it. Sorry, that was an unrelated question from Teams. One thing I just wanted to say here was that whenever in JavaScript you see curly braces like this around some code, that, that means that it's a kind of block of code that happens under certain circumstances. We've seen that before. If we just go into our basic sketch, there's another block. Create canvas, you know, fill, 25500. Ellipse, 150, 150, 100, 100. Um, so this, the curly brackets there are kind of delineating a little block of code and separating it from other code around it. So here, in this instance, that block of code is being delineated from the other parts of the sketch and saying, no, this block is just the setup function. This block is just the draw function. And in a similar way, over here, we're saying this block is only what happens if the condition is true, and this block is only what happens if the condition is false. So we're kind of putting a little fence around some code and saying, just run that code under a certain circumstance. And this is how we control flow. Hmm. So it's really handy, really handy that we can now read these if statements and get a sort of intuitional, intuitionistic understanding of what it's supposed to do. If the sky is blue, we draw an ellipse, else we draw a rectangle. Let's move it into our sketch and just play with that for a second. We don't need the draw function. If the sky is blue, is the sky blue? Yes. So we draw a circle. Is the sky blue? No. We draw a square. Ooh. Let's do some one. A slightly more complicated example, if the sky is blue and the sea is red. So the sky is blue is false, the sea is, is red is false. If the sky is blue and the sea is red, well they're both false, so the that combined statement is also false. If I make that one true, still the sky is blue is false, and the sea is red, which is true. So it's false and true, which is still false. The only way to make it an ellipse now is to make them both true. And we get back to our circle. What about or? The little 
line there for OR is sometimes in a weird place on your keyboard. It's all the way like in the top right corner underneath the backspace on a normal keyboard. I don't use a normal keyboard, so it's even in an even more confusing spot for me, but I usually remember where it is. So even now, if I have one false and one true, we should still get that ellipse. There we go, got the ellipse. And the only way to get the square is if they're both false. Cool. Should we try using this with mouse X and mouse Y? I think that'd be slightly more fun. We'll put it over here in draw. Oh. Oh, I made a big mess of this now because I was commented out. Okay, here's my, got my braces, correct? So I've got matching braces around that code, otherwise it won't work. Uh, now every time we go through the draw loop, we'll do that mouse is, I'll copy that mouse x is small and mouse x is big thing. Where was that? Here we go. Now I have to have this inside the draw loop. Maybe someone can tell me why I can't have this outside the draw loop. If I put it out here, it's not going to work. Someone tell me in the chat why that's the case. Okay, so we're, in, we're going to need a bigger boat. We're going to need a bigger sketch here. Actually, I'll just make that smaller. Okay, so if x is small or y is big, So as my, right now I think y is small and x is small, y is not big, but it's or. So they have to both be false for it to make a rectangle. So I'm gonna to have to make y big and keep, make x big and y small. As I move over here, oh, there we go, it flips. As I move x more than 100, we get my rectangle, my square, I mean. If I move this way, not changing because x is always small. And if I move this way, not changing, because y will be big, which will be true. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? The, the simple joys of exploring code like this. I think this is much more fun than compiling a program and seeing if, it's, if it breaks or not, just to visualize it. What if I put in the and? So now they have to both be true y is small and, oh sorry, x is small and y is big, is down here. In this area of the screen, that will be true, that both x is small and y is big. Anywhere else, won't be true. And a few ideas in the chat as to my question. Uh, someone asked a question which is, if you let a, a variable, does that mean it can change over time? No, that's not, not the answer. You can, I can let a variable, declare the variable up here and just use it down here. I, I don't think there's a way to do like, a, can you do a const in, uh, in JavaScript? Someone Google that for me while I'm lecturing. I always forget if you can or you can't. Another one of those JavaScript things which just slips out of my brain. Sorry about that. Y is big. Whoops, I'm gonna have an, an equal sign in there. I'm missing my equal sign. No, this works just as well. Now the reason is I can't have this out here because mouse X changes every frame. So as that draw loop is running, draw, 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 it, the computer is running this code and I need the computer to check in that moment, what X is. In that very moment, as it's just about to draw the rest of the frame. So I need my check for what mouse X is to happen down here. And this is exactly what Muhammad said it was gonna be. Sorry, Tanvir, Muhammad Tanvir Hussain. Go on, yeah. Um, 
and they have also held me by saying JavaScript does has const. So you can have a constant um, variable. We tend not to use those too much in this class. We're going to need to check our mouse X and mouse Y values within the draw loop. Someone has asked a very important question, which is, can the assignment have mouse X and mouse Y in it? And the answer, um, unfortunately, even though I'm using mouse X and mouse Y right now, the answer is no. Must not use interaction in the assignment um, specification. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'll just add Isaac. Uh, what? <clears throat> yep, and, and someone said they, they used mouse X for debugging, but then they removed it or commented it out. Totally fine to do that. I, I often find it's useful to use mouse X and mouse Y for debugging things, um, but make sure that your monster doesn't need them and that it's not part of your, your dynamic because the tutor is going to mark this by running it and not touching the mouse. So if your monster needs that to run, it will work. Um, I would suggest that you don't include mouse X and mouse Y in your sketch um, in the submitted version. You can use it when you're testing. Okay, let's keep going. Iteration. Oh yeah, JavaScript and P5. Yeah, this is one of those annoying things, which is that I'm teaching you about P5, but also a bit teaching you about JavaScript. There's two things we learn about in this class and the documentation is in a different place. So if you, if you want P5 help, look in the reference. If you want JavaScript help and you're an advanced user, use the Mozilla uh, Developer Network web documentation that includes the best documentation about how JavaScript works. This is where I would go to find out if there is in fact a, uh, a const. Uh, where's grammar and types? Oh, there's const. See, right there. Anyway, so it must be there. If you don't want to read that documentation, I highly suggest you go and read the textbook, Make Getting Started with P5.js by Lauren McCarthy, Casey Reyes, and Ben Fry, 2015. Or the other textbook, Learn JavaScript with P5.js by Engen Arslan. Or Coding Art, The Four Steps to Create a Program with a Processing Language. This one's not actually about P5, it's about a related system called Processing. So these two are great textbooks that will help you to learn these, um, these syntax issues or support what we're doing in the, in the lectures and labs. But you get lots of practice in your labs, so there'll be help there. Okay, fruit loops, not that kind of loop. These are loops of code, and it's something which is gonna let us define a situation where we've got a curly bracket, we've got some lines of code, we've got a matching curly bracket at the other end, and we're gonna run through that code, one, two, three, four, and go back to the start and we're gonna loop over a block of code. So these are the two, two of the fundamental parts of control structures in, or structured programming in computing, the conditional expressions, conditional execution, and iteration. Okay, so you've already seen a loop. You know the draw loop runs over and over again. So how can we make our own ones? Well, helpfully, similar to the, the if statement, it's not that hard. It's a little bit, not quite as kind of um, human readable as the if and else, if else statement, but it's a little bit like that. So the first loop we're gonna look at is called a while loop, the while loop. And this means we set up a block, a code block, there's our curly braces. The code goes in the middle and We've got a condition up here, 
And the rules of the while loop is that we're going to go over and over and over through this code block while condition evaluates to true. So whatever we put in that condition will be evaluated when we get to the start and checked. And if it's true, it runs the code block. Then it goes back to the start, checks condition again. And if it's still true, it runs the code block. And if it's not true ever, it moves on. The execution flow moves on to the next bit. So, just a simple version, while Agatha is sitting, draw circles on a slide, okay? So it's going to run, the computer will get down here, check if Agatha is sitting or not, if Agatha is sitting down, we draw the circles on the slide. If during this time Agatha stands up, when we get to the end and we check if Agatha is sitting again, that will be false. And instead of running this, we just go below, keep running down. We don't do this one last time, we just stop, <laughs> don't do it at all, if that is ever false when we're checking it. So in general, in your code, and this is a, a concept with while loops, you will want to have something in here which changes Agatha is sitting. Otherwise, you might end up in a situation where Agatha is always sitting, in which case your code will never move on to the next thing. <clears throat> and that could cause you problems. <laughs> Uh, it could cause you to never move out of your draw loop and your code will stop. You don't want your flow to stop in your P5 sketches. While triangles have three sides, draw circles on slides. So this one is an example where it's never going to stop because triangles always have three sides. So this is always going to be true. And what we've created here is what we call in technical terms an infinite loop. It's not the end of the world to have an infinite loop. The draw loop is an infinite loop. Somewhere else, somewhere in, in P5, there is some while loop. I guess, uh, I think it's something like this, while um, there'll be some variable called looping or something while looping, you run draw. And if you ever run this function, no loop, that sets whatever variable it is which defines looping to be false. So if I run this, it's not looping anymore. It doesn't work. It stopped. Or if I do it this way, Whenever we get that ellipse, now it's stopped. So we can break out of the loop that way. Okay, here's a little example. Why don't we put this in the, we'll do it together in the sketch. Actually, I just, I'm just going to not have a draw loop for the moment. I'll make a background. And a color. And we'll start with nothing. That's fine. And my loop is going to draw some circles. So often we'll have some kind of variable. Let circles equal five equals zero, while circles less than five, we'll draw a circle, ellipse, random width, random height, random 100, 200, random 100, 200. Okay. Now, what's going to happen? I've got an infinite loop because circles is zero. 
there, we're referring to circles in this statement, circles less than 5, but circles never changes inside that loop. So what I need to do is to add, do something so that circles will change. Circles, whoops, circles equals circles plus 1. Now circles will go from 0. When we, once we make the first circle, we'll have 1. Make another circle, it'll be 2. Third circle will be 3. Fourth circle will be 4. Five circle will be 5. Then we'll check this. Is circles less than 5? 5 less than 5 is false. And it will stop looping. So let's try it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 circles. That's great, isn't it? We got my, I've got full control over circle creation. Neato. Ooh, circles. They're ellipses, actually. I really want them to be circles, so I need another variable. Let circle width equal random 100, 200. The problem was I had a separate random number for the width and the height of the circle, or it should be circle diameter. And I want to put that in here. Oh, the, those circles are sight to behold, aren't they? Make it a bit bigger. A bit bigger. How wonderful. Was that more or less what was here? Oh, they were getting bigger each time. That's a good idea. I didn't do that. There's the example. You can try that one at home. So looping tips, make sure your Boolean expression evaluates to false at some stage, otherwise you'll loop forever. And you probably want to have some variable which you modify within the loop. That was our count or circles variable. What did I call it? Circles. Yeah, while well, circles less than five. I could have had something more specific. Circle count. It's good to have very specific variable names so that it's obvious what you're doing to others and yourself. And when you're writing a loop and looking at your code and trying to work out whether it works or not, try to be the computer. <laughs> You need to use your mental model of the computer running through that code, changing the variables over time to see if it's going to work or not. Think about the types, think about the flow, think about the variables you've got set up and what those Boolean expressions are going to uh, evaluate to. Now, there's one other important kind of loop called the for loop. And this is one where it's a little bit more complicated. It gives you a little bit more detail to control a loop. And the thing that it details is a kind of counting variable. So a for loop has this modifying the loop variable bit kept built in. You have one big long statement at the start where you have your counting variable defined, you have your stopping condition defined, and you have your update to that variable. And in fact, you can do everything in a for loop that you want to in a while loop. So if we had this, this for loop here, we can do this very same loop with while this way. I'll just get this to the top of the page. For let i equal zero, we'll start with let i. Here's the while version. Let i equal zero as a start. While i less than 10. loop code goes here and i equals i plus 1, it goes at the end. Let i equals 0, yeah. So you can see that this saves a little bit of space compared to a while loop. But it's doing exactly the same kind of thing, it's just a 
uh, a nice way to save some space in your code and to put all of the important things about this counting variable in the one line. So you've got them all together. So there's no reason why we can't change this code to use for. So we'll say for let circle count be equal zero, circle count less than five, circle count equals circle count plus one, and we can delete this, and we can delete this one. So we saved a few lines, but we've got this one slightly complicated line up there. We can save a little bit more space. This operation, something equals something plus one, is so common in programming that we usually have a shorthand way of, of doing that. And in JavaScript, it's this circle count plus plus. So that means like tick it up by one. If you want to go down by one, you do minus minus. Circle count minus minus subtracts one. Circle count plus plus adds one. And we should have the same behavior here. I'll just copy this stuff out, comment that out. Still got my five circles with a for loop. Folks, while in for loops, the for loop is a little simpler. Uh, saves a few lines in some circumstances when you're specifically doing these kind of counting variable loops. But you can do everything you want to in a while loop. And if you're new to this, it's no problem just to stick to while loops. They work just fine. Um, it's not a, not a value judgment in this class about whether you use while loops or for loops. You'll often use bits of both. In fact, there's another kind of loop which we'll use where you've got, if you've got a bunch of stuff in what we call an array and you take one out at a time and do something with it, we use a for each loop. And that's a situation where you really do need to use that different construction and the word for. But um, in, in this kind of simple, Simply use case. While or for will do the job. <clears throat> Few differences. You can do the same things with either. And this is the end of our code theory. So in the labs, you'll get a lot of practice with these basics of manipulating the flow of your code. If you're new to coding, this is the most important coding concept in this course manipulating the flow through code to draw an image in the way that you want it and looking at different variables, combining those variables, checking those variables at the right time to understand what your program is doing. And we're at the art part of the lecture, just on 1058, which is wonderful. We've talked a lot about shapes, different kinds of shapes, but not so much about color. And today we're going to talk a bit about color. Uh -oh. Let's check there's no more, no more replies. Oh, is that someone? Someone had a question yesterday about monsters moving. It can be any kind of moving. Any kind of moving is fine. I guess if you do a kind of detailed movement in your assignment, this is, I've gone back to assignment talking, a kind of detailed, sophisticated movement will be better than simple movement like just moving left and right across the screen or the very simple random movement that my robot had, which was quite simplistic, not communicating that much personality. Uh, so a more sophisticated response would have more sophisticated movements. All right, color time. How to think about color. How do we keep track of colors? How do we find colors? How do we make art with colors in P5? Three questions for the next section. So a question I could ask you, and if anyone has a is still listening, they can tell me what they think a primary color is. What is a primary color? I wonder if anyone's listening. I'll just check the, the uh, restream. A few people are watching me on YouTube, which is great. And oh, there's a couple of people on, on stream as well. Wonderful that you're here. Thank you. Someone tell me a primary color. Well, 
What did you learn? You learned this in primary school. Red, blue, and yellow. The primary colors. Oh, someone said RGB. Well, that's good, isn't it? We've got, now we've got two lists of primary colors. Red, green, and blue. But wait a minute. Too young. I, I learned these ones in primary school. So where are these ones coming from? Why, are we ha why do we have two sets of primary colors? Tell me in the chat. I'll drink my drink. So one person said red, yellow, blue, and the answer is, okay, so why do we use RGB then? Someone told me RGB, and the question is, well, why did I learn red, blue, and yellow in primary school? What are, what's the deal? What's the deal with color? You know, you're walking down the street and there's a color out there and you just think, what is going on with that? Why are they teaching me two sets of primary colors? What is even happening? There are too many primary colors out here. We should just decide. Well, unfortunately, life doesn't work like that. We don't get to just decide. There are, in fact, lots of ways of deciding what the primary colors should be. We've got these basic ones, red, green, and blue, that we use in P5 at the moment. There's other primary colors, yellow, teal, and magenta. Ooh, someone's saying one is defined in art and one is defined in light. I think I've got a, a sketch somewhere which will do this. Do my primary colors. Open. Here we go. There's my two kinds of primary colors. This is how I made this one. I'll share this later. But as it turns out, there's two different ways that you can mix colors together, two basic ways. One of those ways is to add the colors together, additive colors. And if you're shining light out of a screen, shining light out of a screen, the way that your screen works, it's additive. And if you want to define all of the colors additively, red, green, and blue turns out to be a set of primary colors. You can use those three colors to define all of the other colors. Another way is subtractive. So this happens in situations where you've got a material which absorbs all the light except for a certain color. So if you've got white light, it's got a spectrum where it's got maximum values of all colors all mixed together. And a certain material, if it has a certain color, is absorbing everything in that sub spectrum except for the color that you want. So when you add two, two of those things together, they subtract from each other. They, they absorb more light, not less. And that works with paint. So if you've got paint mixing, this is screens and lights. If you've got paint, it's subtractive. Then you'll need red, yellow, and blue. And when we were in primary school and even before, we didn't play with screens, we play with paints. So that's the, the way we learn about colors. It makes a lot more sense. So a primary color is a set of colors which can define all the other colors. And we're really familiar with primary colors from, um, from screens, red, green, and blue. They can give us secondary colors, which are the, the next colors that are defined by those. In this case, it's uh, magenta, cyan, and yellow. If you're in a subtractive world, you've got different colors that can be the primary colors. 
One option is red, yellow, and blue for paints. Those ones are chosen in art because those colors are kind of easy to get, I guess, or, or more available. But often in, in print, you might have heard this term CMYK. So that's cyan, and, and ink is subtractive as well, magenta and yellow. So there's yellow, magenta, and cyan. And then K is black. So it turns out in, in, uh, in printing, we use black a lot. So it's better to have black ink rather than trying to combine all the colors all the time to make black. You'd waste all of your other inks making black. So they have a separate black channel to make it just very deep black easily. So you can use yellow, cyan, and magenta as your primary colors. And you get secondary colors, red, green, and blue, <clears throat> as it turns out. Colors are funny. There's a lot of stuff about color, which is like, oh, that's cute. It's cute that things kind of match up. So you've got, the, you've got magenta, yellow, and cyan there as the secondary colors in additive. You've got red, green, and blue as the secondary colors in, um, in subtractive. It's cute that that happens, have a correspondence. And for that reason, people have been thinking about colors for a long time. <clears throat> so two things to know about in P5. Whoops, I'll just take a break for a second, sorry. I'm back. I'm doing much better today with my, my voice, but still not quite completely better. Blend mode is a function in P5, and this one changes how colors interact. So if you layer two colors together, what color do you get? Color mode changes how colors are represented. So that will change what numbers we put into a color or what numbers we put into fill, what color we get out. So blend mode, in general, we use this, uh, what we call blend, linear interpretation, but there's other ways of doing that. So you can replicate subtractive colors as I was doing in this version. So I was using blend mo mode multiply to give me a subtractive situation and blend mode add to give me a additive uh, color and no background <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about color mode today is what that's what we're getting to to start making art with more interesting color modes so let's just take a uh, tour through history about how colors are discussed. I said that people noticed that colors are cute. They behave in interesting ways. Newton, long time. This is a Eurocentric view of color. Sorry about that. If you're, um, I probably should have a more diverse uh, list of sources about color, but this will do for a start. Uh, Isaac Newton, famous physicist, very interested in color, and he noticed that when you shone color through a glass. Thing, a prism, the prism would split up the white light into lots of colors. And he worked out, or wrote down, that the white light must be composed of all these colors added together, which is true. So white light has all of the color information there, all of the color energy. And when you shine it through a prism, it splits it into a whole spectrum of colors, R, G, B, indigo. Later, people were doing more work with colors. Goethe is a famous philosopher. And he started writing down color wheels. Um, I guess writing down things that artists would have known about how colors combine 
and saying, okay, well, red, blue, and yellow, these are our main colors. And then the added colors, you get green between blue and yellow, orange between red and yellow, and uh, dark blue or indigo between red and blue. <clears throat> You can develop this idea, and this is a, from a person called Johannes Itten, a color wheel from the 1920s, again a reference tool for artists, showing how you have the primary colors for paint, red, blue, and yellow, secondary colors, and the tertiary colors. You can combine these colors to start to get a whole spectrum of different options as a painter. Now. This is good if you're a painter. If you've got paint and you have to combine it to make your colors, great. You, you don't want to carry around all of the different colors together, so you probably carry around a, a couple of colors to do your paintings and combine them to work out what colors you want. And as you develop as a painter, people get a really good sense of how to make different colors. But in other situations, we don't really want to define colors in that way. And one situation is if we're trying to, um, I guess, scientifically write down colors using numbers, for instance, we might want a different way of doing it. So this system called the Munsell system was called hue, chroma, and value. So we've got three different um, dimensions of color rather than defining color by combining other colors together. First dimension is hue. So that's the, the color wheel all around here. Red, yellow, red, yellow, green, blue, purple, blue, purple, deep red, purple, etc. The same colors as are around the wheel in the color wheel here and around Goethe's wheel and the same spectrum as we get from Newton. So hue is kind of the color, but we've got other aspects of color, don't we? We've got brightness, We've got how rich the color is. And so this is our other two dimensions. Chroma is the richness of the color. And if chroma is zero, you just get gray. And if chroma is maximum, you get like the most vivid, brightest color, a version of that color that there is. But the color, the hue stays the same smoothly as you change that variable. And then up down, we get bright value or the brightness of the color. So we can have a very rich color, but it's not that bright. 10 is maximum and zero is minimum. So at zero, everything is black at uh, maximum brightness. The, uh, the center of the circle is bright, bright white. And there's two different, two different ways of kind of defining this three dimensional system, hue chroma value, hue saturation, brightness, um, I'm not a color theorist in, in, in particular, so I'm not an expert in what the real meaning is behind these things, but there are very slight differences in how we define these terms. The same, the idea is what matters, which is defining color in terms of three, uh, three different variables, which are related to our human perception of color, not in how the color is mixed, the human perception of color, not how it's mixed. And that means that if you go around a steady point in the circle, you should feel that all the colors are the same, uh, the same brightness and the same richness. And if you take one color and go up and down, you should feel that the hue is the same. It's the same color, it's just getting brighter. And if you move in and out, you should feel that the brightness is the same and the hue is the same, but the, it's just the richness of the color which is changing. And as it turns out, this idea of um, hue, saturation, brightness, hue, saturation, value is very useful in computing because it gives us a way of defining values in perceptual measurements that works well in computer graphics for uh, defining a color space, which is all the possible colors you can make with your system. So what's the point of these things? The idea is to define what color is made of. And that's something that's important to us in 1720 because we have to use colors all the time. All of these European philosophical folks, Newton, Goethe, Itten, 
These people were making combinations of red, blue, and yellow, the primary colors for paint on subtractive mixing, to define what color is made of. Munsell was using three independent properties. Munsell, this system, the Munsell system was for science with color, right? Defining what color dirt was or what color a vegetable is in, and comparing them across uh, a whole of a country, doing a survey. Made of three independent properties, hue, hue, chroma, and lightness. And the idea is that when you change one, the perception of the others is unchanged. And then later on in computing, there was a, a definition of hue saturation brightness as a good standard for computer graphics. And you can read more about that on Wikipedia or the links on the previous few slides. So why should you care? So far, if we make a color, we have to define it in RGB. So if I chose one, I might say fill, you know, 125, 3, 76. So, so far so good, but if I want to make this color more intense, what do I do? <laughs> do I change all three values or just change one? What if I want to make it dimmer? What if I want to shift the hue slightly without changing what the, what, whether it's bright or dark or how intense it is? And with RGB, it's terribly difficult to do that. It's also terribly difficult to guess a color. So you just think, oh, I'm imagining a kind of, a kind of brown color and I want the RGB values with that, you know, give up, right? This is why we have color pickers on the internet that, that help you. Websites that give you a way to select colors and work out what the RGB values is because it's just Im almost impossible to guess what a color is from the RGB values. But you kind of can with hue saturation value. And that's what we'll, we'll talk about that in a, a demo in a little bit. There's the HSB version. So a few more slides about art. What if we made art where color is the material? So really focusing on color as a, a major artistic material. Uh, there's a famous artwork called Olafur Eliasson, who was really, really interested in color. And he has a famous uh, installation in this art gallery in Aarhus in Denmark called Your Rainbow Panorama. And it's a part of a building that just filters the view through colored glass. And as you go around the circle, the color of the glass changes. So you see the view in a different way. And you can see as you're going, the glass is subtractive. It's taking away light because it's got a, a, a tinted filter over it. So when you look through the other side, it's black because it, you can't see, it's filtering out too much light the green side, purple side, and the red side. Another Olafur Ilesson piece called Feelings of Facts. This was an installation inside a big warehouse with uh, smoke and lights. So just the feeling of being inside a color. Other folks have experimented with color. Um, this artist, Roy de Maestra, was interested in the relation between color and sound and created artworks that he called rhythmic compositions or, or gave them uh, sound names. And other, other philosophers and, and thinkers have tried to make relationships between color and sound work because it, it feels like they'd ought to work. Uh, even Newton was doing that. So that's Roy de Maestra's rhythmic composition in yellow green minor, just using particular colors to create something that had a feeling of musicality about it. We can define um, ideas in color in more precision and artists do this. Back to Johannes Itten, who developed seven different contrasts, different types of contrast, contrast of hue, contrast of value or light and dark, temperature, complement, simultaneous, saturation, extension. And contrast is what happens when you put two colors together and it gives you a kind of feeling. So we know that you probably learned in primary school, going back to the color wheel, contrasting colors would be from opposite ends of the color wheel. And they would feel like they're very 
perceptually different, whereas colors that are near each other in the color wheel are perceptually similar. But here Johannes Itten was writing about other aspects of color, not just hue, this is the basic contrast, other aspects that can cause contrasts. So maybe you should think about what contrasts are in your assignment artwork. And Itten was defining these things and creating manuals, putting colors together in different ways to, to show these different ideas for designers and artists. Different kinds of contrasts at different hue levels, different brightness levels, different value levels. Now, how do you choose some colors? You can guess the RGB numbers. I would suggest not. You could go find on the internet different random palettes. These coolers work. Some of these ones disappear. Oh yeah, these are fun. So this website will let you create a, create a palette and then change it. And maybe this is a good way to try to find different palettes for your work. And in your pre-lab task, actually, you'll be expected to find a palette that means something to you and post it on the forum. Maximum blue green. <clears throat> and it's giving us these values here. For those who don't know, this is the same as an RGB value. C5, it's, it's written in hexadecimal numerals, so each pair of numerals gives us a number between 0 and 255. So it's actually that that's the red, this is the blue, and that's the green. Oh, the green and the blue. Oh, we got HSB version instead. Yeah, so fun website to experiment with. What else have I got here? Oh yeah, a bit more reading. I've got links here about while and for, links to a Schiffman video, links to the Mozilla Development Network JavaScript docs. But let's have a look at some color spaces and we'll make some art with colors in P5. So, I'll make a new one. And I said I would be talking about color mode. So, so far, we've just used RGB. This is the default color mode. I'm just gonna grab this I don't really want to grab it. I want to just change to HSB really and experiment. Color mode, we have to use just an O, not a OU in processing because it's American. And our mode options are RGB, HSB or HSL. So you can see a slight differences between hue saturation brightness and hue saturation lightness. I don't think they're actually different, it's just, uh, if they are, someone can tell me. It just, um, has a different word. So if I just type in color mode HSB, we should be ready to go. <coughs> The background's the same because we're just using a brightness uh, indicator there. But if I change the background to, or make a ellipse, we'll do some ellipses, no stroke, ellipse, I'll put it in the middle, 200, 200, 200, 200. And the fill for my ellipse is gonna be um, 0, 100, 100. I think this will be bright red. There we go. It's the flag of Japan. It's a funny thing to draw. But we can make it a non-Japanese flag by changing our number for fill. Ooh, green. Let's play with mouse X and mouse Y, hey? So I'll do mouse X, I'll make a, use a variable, this will be a bit nicer. Let hue equal mouse X. We're gonna, we need a number between zero and 360. And these are the 
the defaults for HSB, you remember that in RGB we had 255 for red, 255 for green, and 255 for blue. In HSB we've got 0 to 360 for hue, Uh, saturation is 0 to 100 and brightness is 0 to 100. So I want to be able to explore by moving my mouse across the screen all of the different hues. So I've divided mouse x by 400 so it's now a number between 0 and 1 and then multiply by 360 so it's a number between 0 and 360. Oh, cool. So you can see it goes all the way around the color wheel and at both ends we're at red because it's a wheel, right? So we start at zero degrees, 90 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. Let's use mouse Y to con control saturation. Height. I'll just change that. It's good to use if you're using a um, drawing a sketch in P5. It's great to use width and height variables rather than hard coding in these numbers because if you ever want to make your sketch bigger, which you often will later in the course, you won't be able to have 600 in every other place. Oh, we didn't use the saturation yet. Whoops, put it in there. So zero saturation, we get white because our brightness is 100. So as I'm moving my mouse left to right, you're not feeling like that color's getting very much brighter or, or darker really. The hue is changing, the brightness and the saturation are staying the same. If I move up here, it gets richer, maximally rich at the bottom. Cool. Okay. What else should we do? What if we... I'd like to make a couple of different... combine what we were doing in the previous uh, sketch. And I'd like to make some random circles. Let number circles, num circles equal zero, while num circles less than 10 them brackets. I'm not going to be able to make this interactive easily because I don't want my circles to jump everywhere but we could we can try. Maybe I'll turn the frame rate down. Frame rate. Let circle x equal random width. Let circle y equal random height. Let circle diameter equal random 100, 300.
Oh, I've got some problem here. Oh, infinite loop. Oh no. I didn't have to find that variable. And I've got to make sure I increment my variable num circles plus plus using a little shortcut there. Still not working. What's going on there? So every second it makes more circles for me. And I didn't want it to flick too badly, so we just turned the frame rate down, which is a neat way to do it. And I can still control the hue with my X and the saturation with Y. But I'd like the brightness to change. Actually, I might change the, so brightness is changing there. I'm going to put my fill in there because I'm going to change hue each time. Let hue equal random 0 to 360. So now I get random colors, but they should have the same brightness and value. So if I move my brightness and saturation all the way up, saturation down, but still very bright, saturation down, the brightness is turning down, it gets to be very dark. Get rid of that background. <clears throat> We can start to make an artwork here. A slightly interactive artwork. As I move my mouse around, I get these extra layers of circles. Now I might do something else with my color because so far we haven't talked about how colors blend together. But you can blend them together in P5. So if I just go to, instead of this, I go to fill. I've got my three values for the color. And then there's an extra value for the fill called alpha. And alpha controls how see-through or solid a color is. So if it's see-through, it will combine with colors behind it. So let's start turning that down. To, I think it starts at 255. So if I turn it down to 100, I should start to see the colors behind come through. Maybe it's maximum 100 in HSB. I'll just check. Now, color mode, too many things to check. Um, where's HSB? Oh, when, you're in, when I'm in HSB mode, it's maximum 360 for the hue, maximum 100 for the saturation, maximum 100 for the brightness, and maximum 1. I'll just copy this in so I'm really sure about what I'm doing. Maximum 1 for the, the alpha. That's okay. Ah, see there, it's starting to look overlaid. Cool. Well, that's some nice color art, isn't it? Maybe this time I'll change, I'll use my mouse to change the hue.
and I'll set the brightness randomly. And I'll set the uh, saturation randomly too. I'm not going to let it get too dark. So the hue is the same with all my circles, but the the brightness and saturation are changing. So they should all look like they're kind of in the same color scheme, don't they? That's cool. I kind of like this. I might turn up the alpha a little bit so that they're less see-through. Ooh, purple blobs. That's neat. Call this one HSB Blobs. Yeah, I think I like this artwork now. I might leave that as is. I'm going to show you one more trick before I go today, folks. This is a trick about, um, about brightness and alpha. Or about background and alpha, actually. So if I want things to fade out, um, easily in P5. A good way to make things fade out in the background, if you're like this, layering them on top of each other, is to use background. So we can, as we know already, you can erase the background completely each time. If you put background 255, it'll draw a white background every frame. But background can take an alpha value as well. So now every frame, it's slowly erasing the, the shapes that were there before. Or slowly erasing them to black. Well, that's cool. If I, where are my shapes? Oh, I was doing, I had shapes that move. So this is last week's sketch, where I had shapes moving across the screen. If I want to give these shapes a sense of movement behind them, I can actually turn down the, um, the alpha of the background drawing. I might give it a white background to start with. Um, because I'm in RGB mode here, the, the number range for the alpha is different, which is very frustrating, but there you go. I'll just experiment with different values. So five, you can see they blur a bit behind them. I'll make it 10. I never quite understand the color modes and the, the blend modes in, in uh, P5 or processing. I never can seem to get rid of this little streak here behind my shapes, but you folks can work it out. This is a nice way just to make some, give some sense of movement across the screen. Have a bit less of a trail. The higher I put this, the less of a trail we get. You can just see it blurred a little bit on the top edge of that one. So a few things you can do with alpha, with colors, and with HSB uh, values. I'm going to start to collect the sketches I've been creating in class and put them in a collection for you that you can find on the website. You can also see the collection from last year where I've got all the sketches we used in class. Um, folks, thanks for putting up with my two lectures this week. I'm glad that I got through this one. I think we've covered the material I wanted to. Keep working on your assignments. Make sure you check it on the test server. Let the CI do its work. I'll be in touch if you haven't forked your assignment yet to remind you to do so. 
check the forum. If you've got any questions, ask them on the forum, as well as talking to your tutors. Folks, have a great week, and I will move to the outro screen. Uh, just as soon as I find it. There we go. See you later.